Um, all right, we're getting uh, sort of, uh, I think we're, we're just about the middle of our seminars, uh, considering that we, I think we had some 16 uh, weeks planned for these seminars. Uh, and uh, today we are in our seminar number eight, which is going to be about uh, mixed methodologies and case study research in information systems. Uh, we have uh, Professor Indira Guzman with, uh, with us. Um, she, she has provided us uh, with uh, several uh, papers that I have included here as reference. It's material that she, of course, she, she, she's going to use in, 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 in her talk. And that could be helpful for those of you who are interested in uh, mixed methods or in, 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 in these more qualitative met methods as well in your research. All right. Uh, I thank you very much, uh, uh, Indira, for, for, you know, being here with us and, and, and showing a little bit of uh, for what you use in your own research and, and what we can use in our research uh, based on your knowledge. So thank you very much again, Indira. If you want to share uh, your screen, I don't know what you, what you want to do, feel free. Uh, I think, it's, I think you, can, you can do that already. Okay, very good. Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you Alex uh, again for the invitation. Let's, so let me just share my slides. Okay, so welcome. I am going to talk about uh, using qualitative methods in information systems research with an emphasis on mixed methodologies and case study research. So, um, so my name is Indira Guzman and I've been in the field for many, many years, more than uh, I think more than 15 years for sure, about 20 years, I think, but um, doing different things with a little bit of emphasis on uh, business side. So definitely information systems, even though my background is in computer science, I have been in the College of Business uh, um, working first at Trident 16 years, and now I'm working for uh, Cal State, California State uh, University in Pomona, uh, but uh, still in the College of Business. So uh, I, I heard some of the conversations uh, that you had uh, in the previous sessions, and I know that some of you work in the field. So that's why, uh, and also I heard the presentation from Guillermo, right? And I thought, uh, and I heard some of the comments we had there as well as the, uh, the panel that you had in this class. So based on that, I thought, you know, maybe this could be something that students would consider, that you would consider uh, and, and using uh, mixed methodologies and then uh, specifically using case study. I mean, I, I was going to talk only about qualitative methods or quantitative, but I'm trying to focus on things that you might uh, consider using in your own research. So first, I, I thought if you could please uh, tell me a, a little bit about what research topics or questions do you have. If you could just type your topic or research question and then feel free to type it in English, Portuguese or Spanish. I would really like to, to know what kind of topics you're interested in doing research on and writing a paper since this is all about that. While we are writing that in our chat, uh, I have to tell you that Indira has has taken a, an intensive course in Portuguese, right, Indira, over yes. a week. <laughs> she was in Cuiabá last week with uh, some of the Brazilians, some, some colleagues, not only Brazilian researchers. Uh, I think you had the whole group, right, coming to, 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 to Cuiabá, yeah. right, Indira? Yeah, we have a research uh, team. Um, it's from Peru, Bolivia and Brazil five universities in Brazil, uh, one university in Peru, and two universities from Bolivia. So it's uh, it's been really nice. Uh, I mean, it was my first trip to Brazil, and I have to tell you, I love the day that I fell in love. <laughs> and it's uh, Brazil is so nice, but people, of course, that's the most important. And the food, oh my gosh, I ate so much. Uh, but yeah, really good. So... Um, Are you writing I, there, guys? Where can I see the chat box i mean i see the chat box, uh, i think you, you see the chat box uh when you click on where you click on i i, I never know exactly where you yeah click. i don't see any, it's, uh, any it, yet. It, there is a like a, a balloon or something somewhere yeah in your I, I, I see it but i don't see anybody but no I people haven't it. written anything yet oh, that's so, why yeah. you see i don't see anything yeah you so don't see anything don't be because to, uh either the um the title of your research or 
uh, your research question if you already have it. Yeah, this is uh, I, while they're thinking and writing something down there. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, up to now in Jira, we we haven't still pushed them towards that. So some may still think, "Oh, do I have a, a research project already?" Uh, some of them may still not have a research project or a okay. research idea. But, but you can uh, have but, some ideas. But we already yeah. have some people. I noticed that Erica was uh, typing there, and she has already included hers. That maybe she makes others a little less shy, and they they also start writing so maybe you can already start uh, thank you erica yes this is about governance in smart cities and uh, living lab in latin america very good there's a lot on smart cities and we have a great um, team of researchers in that area yeah she's working with uh, mahima kadar uh, oh that makes sense okay mm -hmm. very good Okay, so I'm just going to let you type, guys. I see that you're thinking about that. And uh, um, the other question, I'm going to get back to, to, to your topic. So don't worry, please think about that. And then we're going to talk about uh, what methodology you plan to use, if it's going to be quant, qualitative, uh, with questions of what do you or how do you, you know, those are the typical when you are uh, using uh, qualitative uh, uh, research qualitative methodologies, your research questions are uh, open, right? So what uh, happened or how happened versus if you're using quantitative methods, usually in social science research, uh, uh, you're using surveys where you quantify the answers by using Likert scales from, you know, one, uh, say, strongly disagree to five strongly agree. So those are just examples. And I hope again to hear uh, what is it you're planning to do if you are, uh, if you have already thought about that? In any case, and I brought up, again these slides to, to kind of um, um, discuss your own topics. And I, I just wanted to emphasize uh, again, based on the discussions we had before, that it's very important to receive as much feedback as possible. And last session, Alexander was talking about. Uh, um, sending papers to a conference on uh, before a journal and it's all about receiving feedback and receive it as much feedback as possible it's very important to have as a researcher uh, the ability to discuss your research ideas uh, with as many possible many people as possible so this is a good venue even you know this class and just don't be shy and talk about the topic because the more you talk about it the better you get at it as well as uh, having the different versions you know have the two minute version the five minute version the 30 minute version uh, so the more you talk about it the better it is for you because you even are able to articulate your topic in a better way and also narrow it down and um, and also get the feedback. Um, as we mentioned before, conferences are a good uh, opportunity and we hope you participate in the conferences that we organize with LACAIS. Now, once you receive feedback, um, you want to uh, be receptive and open-minded. Uh, there is always room for improvement and change as well as uh, there's not an exact solution. I mean, whatever you're trying to write about, uh, is, uh, it should be a unique contribution, which is why there wasn't a publication on that before, right? So it's uh, that's the point. You're trying to do something that other people have not done. And maybe they have uh, used uh, your, your variables or your theory, the, the one that you want to use or your methodology, but they haven't got that combination. And I want to tell you that I always uh, think uh, about doing research like cooking. <laughs> Again, you know, I, look, I like eating and I like cooking as well. But I feel that when you do research, it's like you're trying to come up with your own unique recipe. It's a unique recipe, but you see all the ingredients, you don't, um, um, you don't, uh, create the ingredients from scratch, right? Everything is made like, you know, the the even the type of cuisine, maybe you like French cuisine, Japanese cuisine, you know, 
Peruvian cuisine, Bolivian cuisine, Brazilian cuisine. I mean, the, every cuisine has its own uh, techniques, styles. Uh, but um, then you have the ingredients. I mean, everything is, exists already. Many things are there. You don't have to think uh, to come up with things from scratch. But what you are coming up with is your combination, right? And then it's going to be your own recipe. So that's how I see doing research again. It's like cooking. You're trying to come up with your own fantastic new recipe and you want to make sure that it's uh, something that people will accept and think that it's 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 great but also you want to do something that it's replicable so you're writing your your um, recipe in a way that when somebody reads your recipe they are able to make and end up with the same product as you did with the same great uh, food and meal that you just came up with right so that recipe so that's why we are using um theories uh, methods uh, techniques that uh, are that were used before but then you are either challenging them or adding your own contribution to them to come up with your own recipe so i'm just going to refer to the whole um coming up with the recipe as as we speak but uh, going back to the importance of receiving feedback, you want to be receptive and um, you know that there is no exact solution. That's why this, this process of inquiry in research is, uh, is so, uh, so much fun. I, I, I really uh, enjoy uh, doing research because then you're discovering things and you're writing things. So receiving feedback is a very important part of that, uh, so, which is why I encourage, you know, just sharing your ideas. You know, I'm interested in, in studying uh, I don't know uh, uh, the 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 impact of the system in my own organization. Why people are um, not happy with the with the? In many cases, you start with something negative. You know why uh, we are uh, not uh, uh, we turnover is high, customer is not satisfied, uh, the process is too slow, you know, sometimes the negative things uh, give you ideas of why is it you want to do research on that. It's because something wrong is happening and, and again, uh, there is a problem that you want to solve and um, when you receive feedback, you uh, want to think about that and process that you you won't always I, I i always tell my students you know you don't have to accept whatever your um committee members tell you always if they tell you uh, go green go blue go yellow you should not accept everything they tell you you have to make the choices which way you're gonna go based on your own research i mean when you're doing your research it's your baby it's your own it's uh, your topic again it's your baby so you should make the decisions but justify those decisions yeah i'm going green because of this and i'm not going yellow because of that of course respectfully agree or disagree with the, with the committee members and and uh, reviewers and anybody who's giving you feedback uh, everybody's giving you feedback because they they again they, they're interested in this discussion but it's you, the author, who should make the decisions and be able to justify the decisions you make. So having this as a background, let's talk about the mixed methodology. And the reason, again, I, I wanted to discuss this too is because I thought there could be a ways that, uh, that um, methodologies that you may want to consider based on the background that you have. So mixed methodology, uh, well, here is just a definition, but it's a structured uh, system. I mean, any methodology is pretty much like a, a technique, right? And, uh, where you have certain steps, certain ways of cooking, ways of doing research. And in mixed methodologies, it really is the, uh, as any type of methodology, uh, guidelines to, to help you generate valid and reliable research results. Now, the beauty of mixed methodology, as it says in the name, mixed, is the combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches in research methodology in a single particular study or in a multi-phase multi -phased study. So now remember um, that um, more complex studies can have multiple phases, be, I don't know, a longitudinal or even a multi-case study. Uh, but uh, in any case, there is a main, main uh, 
research question, a main topic that you're interested, or you want to know uh, how uh, gover to govern smart cities, you know, the example that Erica is, is talking about. Th there's something you want to know, there's a main research question, but you can approach that research question from different perspectives. And the mixed methodology is particularly my favorite because it gives you uh, multiple views and uh, the reason here, you see this other slide shows how you can achieve sometimes the things that both things that both advantages of both methods with quantitative methods, you're looking for breadth, you know, at the larger scale sample, you have, you need a lot of um, a large, well, you have to calculate your R's, uh, your um, which, uh, uh, number of people you need, how many responses you need based on the G power, you know, whatever um, uh, error, acceptance error you want statistically. So G power is the most common one, but the idea is that with quantitative, you need uh, numbers, right? You need uh, a certain number of responses to, um, to uh, obtain uh, significant results. And with statistics, you need significance, right? Something to be significant. And whereas in qualitative, you are uh, getting, obtaining depth, depth. And it could be a single study, uh, um, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, in terms of the scale, you can, uh, um, you can uh, obtain, you, you, you need less participants, which is why uh, it's sometimes more doable, but uh, it requires a lot of time but uh, in terms of what you obtain from that is you obtain depth. So again, remember the breadth and depth, uh, those are advantages of each method, but when you use mixed methodology, you can uh, obtain, uh, add depth and breadth to your uh, studies. So um, again, uh, this is something that uh, you want to uh, consider uh, and, and this is why mixed methodologies are, are interesting. Now, of course, they could take longer. And, and, and that's why I thought, OK, you know, I'm just going to start with the short introduction to mixed methods because uh, it's on one side, it is it adds breadth and depth, uh, but it could take longer. But also it could create more of a complex study. And uh, lately, um, I mean, you know, there are so many uh, uh, studies there, and then sometimes um, having a, a multi-faced study uh, with mixed methodologies can increase your possibilities of also uh, uh, publishing. Uh, something that um, we we have to remember is that uh, publications have been mostly quantitative in information systems, but there is a lot of um, uh, recent uh, emphasis also on qualitative research. I, I attended um, three weeks ago, I think, one of the uh, presentations from, um, you know, MIS Quarterly uh, that uh, they, 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 and and I remember also uh, Demira talking about the, the, how they are open to qualitative research. So that's a great thing because I remember, uh, and I'll tell you how I started doing mixed, mixed methodology because when I was writing my dissertation, I was um, actually a very qualitative. You know, I had a lot of uh, qualitative research with my uh, with my advisors, but then uh, again, I always um, because I worked in banking before and you know my experience in in the impact of information systems. I like the emphasis on the, the use administration of information systems in, in in businesses, which is why you know I, I thought you, you want to see where you fit, right? Are you in a computer science school? Are you in engineering school? Are you in a business school? And and information systems is, or or the information school, which is where I was, which is really pure you know information school, um, but. You see where you want to publish. I want to publish more in computer science journals. I want to publish in, in information systems journals. And information systems specifically, you know, with an emphasis on how you use information systems within businesses. 
So if you look at the business journals, you know, information systems journals, there's a lot of quantitative. So when I was writing my dissertation, I thought, oh, okay, you know, if I am qualitative, purely qualitative, I'm just never going to publish in information systems journals. That's what I, that's, uh, that's what I thought. And, and, and then, um, so I thought, okay, you know, if I want to, I, I have to show that I am uh, versatile in that way that I am able to conduct qualitative and quantitative, especially, you know, thinking about looking for a job or where you want to see yourself as a researcher. So I thought, no, I have to be open to quantitative. And uh, well, luckily, I always like numbers. So uh, I went, okay, I will do my qualitative piece, but I will also include my quantitative uh, components. So, so I, uh, I, that's why I started doing mixed methodology back then in, in my dissertation, uh, using both, the, the beauty of both methods. So uh, kind of like a sweet and sour recipe, right? So sweet and spicy, uh, so mixing the different flavors. Now, of course, every time you conduct research, you have to make decisions. So decisions, decisions, what kind of method am I going to use? What kind of, so I have an interest in a topic that uh, if you saw the little happy face before, you should have passion for your topic. I mean, you really have to like a topic. It, it has to be a topic that you um, love, that you're curious about. In many cases, the topic that you are choosing is something that you have experienced and maybe, again, you are working. Uh, it's something that you uh, have seen uh, uh, firsthand or that you're still working on that area or you worked before, or you've seen that others have done it. And so, so it has to be a topic that you really love uh, because otherwise it's a torture to work on a topic that you don't like, right? It's really a torture to work on a topic that you uh, don't appreciate. But uh, once you have a topic, then you have to decide which methodology to use. And so these are just some some of the, um, uh, the um, things that you have to consider, you know, criteria, access, do you have access to the data that you need to conduct this research? So for example, if you're talking about uh, governance in smart cities, do you have a context where you would, uh, where there is uh, uh, an infrastructure related to smart cities? If you don't, then it's gonna be uh, difficult unless you use literature review maybe to compare, but you need access to the uh, people or the infrastructure that you are going to study. So um, you need uh, the time, obviously, uh, like we, and I'll show you a couple of slides where we compare two studies with one of my uh, co-authors, friend and, and, and mentor, Michelle uh, Cars brown where we compared two studies and uh, we were um, comparing her, uh, her approach and mine and sometimes qualitative research can take a very long time, you know? So you, do you wanna be like uh, years collecting data or months collecting data versus sometimes with surveys, if you have the right people at the right time, you might. I, I have students who have used uh, some of the um, data sources like uh, Mechanical Turk or um, Qualtrics, or, you know, those are uh, databases where people sign up to, to, to answer surveys and you just pay for that and then um, because the database the people are, are so many you can obtain 300 400 responses in less than a week you know so, uh, so again you, you have to consider time how much time you want to spend collecting your data um, so again first do you have the access to that to to those people those uh, that context do you have the time how much time are you willing to to invest on in that do you have the budget i mean whatever uh, approach you take is going to take, uh, you know, resources, and that's obviously money. And the legitimacy, uh, once you uh, uh, publish, uh, again, where do you expect to publish? Where is your dream to publish? Are you, again, planning to publish in computer science journals or in business journals, information systems journals? And and um, so where you want to fit? We, we talk about, you know, the authors that you wish you, you, uh, you would collaborate with. Uh, of course, generalizability. Do you care about generalizability? Uh, maybe if you don't, then of course you can go with a with a qualitative uh, case study approach. But if you care about generalizability, you have to go quantitative. 
uh, and look for numbers. And then how do you plan to use the findings? Whatever findings you obtain from your study, are you looking more from a practitioner perspective or are you looking more for a theoretical perspective, theoretical contribution? What country, kind of contribution you want to make to the literature? So again, so those are some of the decisions that you need to make. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, with my uh, one of my co-authors, Michelle uh, Cars Brown, we uh, we we wrote this um, paper um, uh, a few years back, but we compared the mixed methods uh, versus uh, ethnography. Well, she she did a study uh, on ethnography using ethnography, um, and we both did a study on culture, and we compared these and. Uh, but we saw that the mixed method had advantages in terms of being, um, you could talk about generalizability because again, it had the quantitative component um, combining both the qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, the data volume was moderate compared to purely qualitative in the ethnography. I mean, her uh, work was, huge you know the data was just amazing for because she was collecting data for years and remember with qualitative methods you're using you're collecting words recordings and, and the data was just huge in her case and um so the ability with mixed method is that you can uh, the, the the volume of data is going to be actually uh, more manageable moderate and and then uh, uh, you are able to integrate uh, data as well as uh, having less time again and lower cost compared to uh, pure ethnography and then again thinking where to publish right you may have more uh, options if you are doing purely pure qualitative it's good to see that uh, uh, journals are more open to purely qualitative but again journals and information systems um, not all of them are really open to purely qualitative research now, um, uh, here again, we compare the, the ethnography with mixed methods, and you see, we, we could also see the depth and breadth. Uh, you see the, the purely qualitative was really deep, again, ethnography and studying culture. She was living, it, she conducted the study on, on a, uh, insurance companies um, using technology and uh, it was a really um, deep and rich, you know, like amazing quotes, stories of people, of situations, and uh, and in 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 the in the business environment. In whereas in the mixed method approach, uh, you know, we had uh, the combination um, and a broader sample, right? So it's really again you, you obtain more responses. So I provided uh, four readings for you, four articles that I hope are useful. One of them is a 2022 uh, article, so it's very, very uh, fresh, just published by uh, three German authors that I actually uh, know. And I'm very happy when I see publications of my friends there. You know, it's always uh, nice to see uh, what they did. And in this publication, um, they uh, actually... Um, looked at uh, 52 mixed methods papers in information systems and uh, they um, analyzed them i mean they they, com they conducted a, a, a thorough literature review of them uh, to uh, uh, understand what kind of um, how these mixed methods uh, papers um, were able to um, elaborate the the purpose, the meta interfaces, as they call it, uh, referring to the um, theoretical um, approaches, and then the validation data. So they, um, it's good that in the in their article uh, they provide. Um, so if you look at that article, you can see uh, those 50, 52 articles that they uh, found how they identify those articles. So you can see there a great examples of mixed methodology. That's why I gave them to you. And of course, some of the uh, conclusions that they make based on the research, what are the things that they found to be uh, important in, in, in mixed methods? 
so first again you have 52 um, articles that use mixed methodology and information systems so you can look based on the titles some examples that you might be more interested on and uh, again uh, the synthesis on how they think are the what are the advantages and our mixed methods in, in their view based on their analysis so they said that um uh, so they were trying again to to compare those studies and see what is it they found so they found that the characteristics is that again mixed methods uh, deliver a strong inferences and multi uh, multifaceted insights into a phenomenon of interest so again you have the multiple views and uh, a strong inferences so really it allows also for uh, very robust research using mixed methods and then that it allows the uh, inclusion of several epistemological perspectives uh, with paradigmatic assumptions. So it really, uh, you can see not only the different uh, methods, but also apply uh, these different perspectives uh, from even um, uh, in, in terms of the authors, right? Uh, in terms of the participants, uh, different points of view. I uh, provided also in this uh, in the set of articles um, one example of mixed methods in, in and I thought that you should uh, see that one in Spanish uh, which is uh, which is actually the first publication in the Relcasi journal it's a 2008 article but um, it shows the sequence you know the, when you use mixed methodology uh, the most important is that it should be to address the one research question you have one, one main research question but it the what you're thinking you're thinking about the use of mixed methods but you need to define if they're going to be like in a sequence you know first this first go say uh, um, qualitative then quantitative or doing at the same time um, but whatever choice you make it has to be for a reason like it just shouldn't be just because it's it's convenient there, there has to be a justification and these authors when they uh, wrote about these 52 uh, mixed method studies they say that um, to the uniqueness of the mixed methods includes that starting the purpose of the uh, stating the purpose of the uh, mixed method study is crucial so again knowing why you're doing mixed methods is very important again being able to articulate right like why am i doing this not because it looks sounds fancy because it really helps you uh, do something in your research you know better see that approach answer the uh, to uh, to really answer the question at the end so justify state also be clear why you're doing this there has to be a reason and um, and then uh, from a theoretical the theoretical statements have to also be clearly identified. So they recommend, you know, after looking at all these 52 papers, that if you go with mixed methods, this is something that you have to clarify up front. You know, think about that. Uh, now I have to tell you, many things as a as a researcher you you find as you go, but when you write about it, like. You will write the conference paper or journal then you have to justify why you did it so remember it's like my cooking example uh, sometimes you learn that you know your recipe needed more salt or less salt but at the end when you perfection your your uh, um, get into the perfect recipe you need to state how much salt is really needed you know just is it one spoon is it two spoons and be uh uh, be able to say okay you know why one spoon is the best one because i tried with two and it was bad <laughs> and i tried with a half and it was not good either so i i have a reason i have a justification so um they are saying you know when you write using mixed methods justify state clearly why you're doing that because otherwise it doesn't sound good for the reader right like why is this doing this and that and uh and again, they also emphasize the, the robust kind of research that you can obtain use mix, using uh, mixed methods. Uh, you have the strengths and um, non-overlapping weaknesses of both methods. Uh, so, uh, um, and then they also talk about the validation, right? Which again, in mixed methods are, could actually be easy to justify why uh, both uh, looking at the advantages of the products that you could obtain 
uh, the 52 papers that they analyzed were from 2014 to 2021. And uh, even though it's a very small sample, I mean, 52 articles that they did uh, research on, they see that there's a little bit of, uh, of increase. And I like that, you know, I have, so oh, that's great. People are talking more about mixed methods, so that's great. Um, so again, I um, encourage you to look at that article. I, I provided that one. And uh, these are the final recommendations from uh, Ray's et al. in this 2022 article. I think about the purpose first. Uh, I, I like this conclusion that they, they had, so I, I copied here. Uh, think about the purpose first. What is it you want to achieve? And maybe it's something that it's, I, I would like to use uh, all day. I want just depth and breadth. Um, and um, select the purpose guided research design uh, you have to select uh, again the best the one that best suits your your looking at all the things that i mentioned before you know the time the uh, where you want to publish if you care generalizability all those aspects so select the, the purpose guided research design um, I, I thought it was interesting Do not talk too much about paradigms, but capture their essentials. Uh, so, um, because some articles talk, start like if they're going to be quantitative, they start talking about positivist. Uh, but, well, in this case, they're saying, you know, don't, don't go too much into that and stay open to what other research paradigms have to offer. Uh, so building this combined reality. And then state uh, meta inferences explicitly in a dedicated section. Uh, this, I think, this advice goes well with anything, but refers to capturing um, uh, the the theoretical contribution and and be uh, making it. Uh, uh, before the the findings, but um, emphasizing on that. Um, uh, theoretical contribution. I mean, in research, you want to always say what uh, what kind of theoretical contribution you're making. And in some cases, um, you know, traditional uh, research is, is looking uh, to make a theoretical contribution to um, enhance theory, whereas applied research is using theory. And when with traditional research in a PhD, you're extending theory versus in an applied research. Uh, and, and I hope it's clear what, what I mean by applied research, uh, more uh, towards the kind of research that you might be thinking, since I know you are uh, working in, in the field, is using theory. So you have to think where you want to, uh, to be in that sense. I, I tell my students, uh, when when I had to uh, the two research the two doctoral programs a PhD is a more traditional um, PhD where you are uh, making theoretical contributions um, and whereas in a, a DBA a, an applied kind of uh, doctoral degree you are using theories and and enhancing an understanding from a practitioner perspective so. Um, so again, this, this advice on articulating your theoretical contribution uh, is, is also important. And of course, uh, validate all inferences, um, uh, qualitative inferences or quantitative inferences uh, and meta inferences. Uh, so it's really validation of the data collection quality, the data quality, the research methods, deduction of inference. This is all about uh, being very specific. So going back to my cooking example, if you want somebody to replicate your research, you have to be very, very detailed and very accurate, right? If you just say, ah, you know, it's just mixed ingredients, no, you should tell us which ingredients go first, which one is going to go second, which one is going to go third. So you talk about, again, thinking about uh, uh, rigor and thinking about replication. Somebody look at your article and then they try to replicate, they should be able to find the exact way of replication. And finally, the second article that I provided, again, one is um, mixed methods, uh, the 2022, and the other is my, my, my article from um, uh, 
it's 98, I think, uh, no, 2008, sorry, 2008 article that I provided in, in Spanish that used mixed methods. So they, in that example, uh, I used a sequential methodology, meaning that the qualitative went, came first and the quantitative went second. It wasn't at the same time. There was a sequence, so that's why it was sequential. In the qualitative phase, I used uh, focus groups, semi-structured uh, interviews, and then structured interviews. So it was really a, a sequence of uh, data collection. Um, the focus groups allowed just this whole um, open discussion. Uh, I mean, in a focus group, you don't want to have more than uh, between six and 10 people, no more than 10, definitely. That's not manageable. It has to be a small group. But you get great input. And, and remember, uh, some, some students ask me, when do I stop collecting data in qualitative methods? So, well, you should stop collecting data in qualitative methods when you see that people are telling you the same thing, you know, when you achieve saturation. So basically, when you, you're getting the same things over and over again, that's it, you're done. Yeah, as a researcher, you should move on to uh, to the next phase or start analyzing your data. But that's um, uh, that's really when you stop, right? So in, in this case, um, we, uh, well, this was, I say we because, you know, I, I always do research with others, right? So with my research team, we collected. Um, uh, we did the focus groups. I think there were nine, nine focus groups. That's why I had the nine. Um, then the semi-structured interview. Structure. And after that, we conducted a, an online survey. And for the uh, for the survey, um, we had a traditional model that I'm sure when you start talking about the quantitative methods, you look at your independent variables and dependent variables. So we had, the, you know, mediating or moderating variables. So we had a, a typical uh, research model. Uh, but one of the uh, constructs was built uh, and developed based on the qualitative data. And you will hear when you go into the quantitative methods that you should always use reliable uh, reliable instruments um, so that's why uh, building your own instrument is uh, requires multiple iterations of data collection uh, so you have to collect and uh, check uh, statistically uh, analyze and then collect the, revise collect data again uh, check analyze co revise collect data again collect data again and so on multiple times that's why creating your own instruments is really tricky and really time consuming. So when you get to quantitative data, you've talked about that. But my point here is that uh, even for that, the mixed methods was useful because it allowed us to develop uh, uh, the instrument for one of the constructs in the study. Uh, and, and the others were coming, were adapted from the literature. So um, again, and then analyze, come, being able to write about the final results using the knowledge that you are, you acquired in the first phase and in the second phase this is important about mixed methods you know just you should be able to combine that so again you have that example there as and so that's pretty much what i wanted to cover about mixed methodology and then go into uh, the case study research more specifically as one way that you can uh, use. Before I go there, I would like to see if there are any questions, comments, and anything that maybe uh, somebody wants to add. Oh, in general, while they're, they're thinking about their own questions, I have my own because I've always uh, been taught as a student that we used uh, mixed methods as a way of triangulating our results, right? And, and making sure that uh, our conclusions were consistent. But uh, my experience has always shown that what we do is more sequential, like, like you, you, you said. And when we do sequential research, it's really not triangulation. We are actually using each method for what it's best. Uh, so we may use qualitative methods to sort of understand the problem more generally, more with without being uh, uh, very concerned about a, a specific. Well, it, it, it's it's interesting because we cannot the, the 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 qualitative methods allows you to understand the whole, but you cannot infer much to other situations than than the one that you are analyzing. 
Mm -hmm. But you still, being, being qualitative, you can explore details, but it's mm -hmm. always the details of that case. And I think you're going, when, when you start talking about the case, that's probably one of the things that you're going to say. We, you, 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 you are, as a researcher, you get to know a lot about that case, but you cannot infer for others, right? right. And then the quantitative wants to allow you to infer something. So, uh, and, and then uh, one thing that I, I, you know, at least when my students ask me, what comes first, the qualitative of, or the quantitative, uh, I, I go back to something that you were saying, uh, that, well, what, what is the problem that you want to solve, right? Because, uh, there, there will be situations, I, I, I guess, where you will start from a qualitative uh, study to sort of figure out where you are in the world, and, and then you will be more quantitative to get to go deep into, into a specific problem. And there will be mm -hmm. other situations in which you've already gone deep into a specific uh, problem, and then you got all those, for example, answers for a survey, and then you need to, to understand why uh, the answers you got were the answers you got. And then you go qualitative again. So it seems that it's sort of a wheel that you, you go from one method to the other, but always trying to advance uh, your understanding of a, a situation. And I don't see, uh, I, I usually don't, I, I, at least I don't find it easy to use mixed methods for triangulation, you know? That was what at least my teachers were always telling me you use that for triangulation. I, I was never able to do that. Do you find it easy to, uh, or, or have you been able to, to use mixed methods for triangulation uh, in your in your experience? Um, I, I, ha I have, um, yeah, I think that's why the case study is more, um, more appropriate for triangulation. But I know that in the literature, it, it says, yeah, definitely that you can use mixed methods in a way that uh, you can triangulate, compare the, the um, but I, I I would say that I find it more organized to do in a sequential way. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, now um, in case you study, yes, triangulation. Yeah, so I can, I can. I yeah, in the case study, it makes it makes more sense. But because if, even in the case study, there will be some some of uh, your activities that will be more qualitative, other more quantitative. But you're focused on solving a specific problem, and then you use whatever tool you can, right, to make sure that you get closer to answering that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, but I don't know. Th th this may be something that uh, some of our students will also experience that. I mean, we are never we, we as researchers are never happy with the level of understanding of a problem that we already have. We always want yeah, to go that's further. True. Like right? you always uh, want more. But, but uh, at the end, once once you are uh, done with the study, when you kind of write your conclusions, in a way, um, you tend to reflect on the things that you found, and in both uh, in both data collection methods, uh, or or as you can see in the the one that I did, we 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 use multiple techniques, right? Multiple data collection, because one thing was the focus, one thing was the interview, the other was the semi-structure interview, the other was the uh, the survey. But uh, at the end, when you see things that uh, you found everywhere, and it's just fascinating. So it's, so that is, uh, that could be also in a way of triangulation. Triangulate. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, when you realize, okay, you know what? This is amazing because this was consistent everywhere, but, it wasn't as well articulated as uh, uh, it, it wouldn't have been as well articulated if we haven't used all these methods. Like I would, we would have thought because many times, you know, as a researcher, you hypothesize, right? Like you think, oh, this is going to happen. This is how I think it, this should be, and then uh, you you are not able to confirm your your hypothesis, and and at the end you realize, oh yeah, that's the that's the the light you know that's the, the 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 great idea and now that you think about it it came out everywhere it, it's something that in the focus group people said as well as now in the survey you see it just had a different name and now we know how to call it mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah so i think that could also be an example triangulation well questions guys this group tends to be t uh, tends to be quieter than I than than I wish they were. Uh, I mean, this is the, the opportunity of talking to someone who who has been doing uh, mixed methods uh, research for quite a while. <laughs> well, uh, but I I see you know uh, 
Patricia is also saying, I just entered the doctorate. So, uh, but um, remember that you are still uh, someone uh, with a uh, with a topic in mind, like you are in information systems, or you, you can go. You always will narrow down your topic. You always start broad, like you know, in a, in a triangle here. You start broad, like I am a, a an information systems researcher. Why? Because I would like to see. I I, I I like to see the impact of technology, uh, better things that people can use technology for, advantages about technology. I like to, like you have some overall dream and then you narrow down, oh yeah, I'm looking at, um, you know, just uh, smart cities within smart cities. And then within smart cities, there are more topics and within, within are more topics. So you always narrow down. So I'm sure you all have some, um, idea overarching you know a high level idea and then you will narrow down so um don't be shy you know it's like i'm interested in electronic commerce i'm interested in information security i'm interested in something with business uh, intelligence i'm interested in you know you you can definitely uh, say that you are already somebody interested in some area and you will narrow down later on but uh, that's why i said I ask it either your topic or your research question if you already have. Having a research question is a process. There's no way you can have it from the first time. You know, you will, you should, and, and that's why you should just try to say something and then you would keep narrowing down and improving your research question. But uh, always try to start with something. <laughs> right, so we always have to start with a topic, right? Well. All yeah. these people, they are already here because for whatever reason, they would they are interested in information systems. Mm -hmm. okay? yes. So yeah, that, that already gives us a, 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 an, an umbrella under yeah, which our, our research problems are going to be, right? Mm -hmm. There are research problems that will be of interest to the information systems fields. And there are others that maybe you would be, it would be easier to publish or you would find other uh, a community that would be more interested in that topic, maybe in marketing, in operations management, or or in computer science, right? So, and and this is why we spend so many um, of our meetings so far discussing, uh, you know, where we came from in information systems, where we think that our our field is going from here, because that gives you hints of topics that will interest other researchers in information systems. But you should already have at least a topic of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Indira, even if they don't write, uh, uh, while you were talking, I was asking them, please write down there in our chat what your research topic is, or at least uh, uh, you know, give us an idea. Not many have done that, but now it's time that you, you will have to start pushing you because remember, we have a commitment with a at least a draft of a research paper uh that we'll have to draft until december uh and that we hope that is polished over the month of january february because in march we have already the process of uh submission of papers to amsis and yes. uh, our intent here in Jira's intent my intent uh guillermo's intent everyone who's who's been here talking to you our intent is that maybe next year when we have this conference in panama we have several of you here writing a paper submitting a paper to that conference that will be in in the information systems field in latin america which makes it easier for us to to participate and even if you say if we, and and we have a lot of course all of our panamanian colleagues here uh, that will be at home uh, so it will be uh, even easier for them to submit papers there because if, even because of um, well, money, right? It's going to. They don't even have to travel, or don't have to travel that far to to be there in, in Panama City. Uh, but even for those who will not be able to be there face to face, we will either find ways in which you can participate of the conference uh, in a, mm -hmm. a hybrid, in a remote uh, way, or uh, if if that's uh, impossible, uh, uh, well, it will be possible. But but of course. The AMSIS conference is still a paid conference where, and, and then if you say, well, I, can, I cannot afford the, 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 um, the registration to the conference or whatever, then you submit it to ISLA, the Information Systems in Latin America conference, and that's a completely free uh, conference. So 
there is no excuse for us not to have uh, a, a paper, but we first have to have a topic, as Indira said. We start from a broader idea. Then we have to work on an objective or a, a research question. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's that's already polishing up or starting from the topic. You start reading other people that are writing about that, and then you start having your own ideas. And then you, you have a research question. Then you have to think in which ways are you going to deal with that. Uh, and that's what uh, Indira is talking about today. This, uh, when you use a mixed methodology, it means that you're going to address your research uh, project or, or your research question from different perspectives, or at least parts of it you're, you're going to 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 split in in in, in smaller uh, chunks and each chunk you're going to use a specific method that is the most appropriate for that right but we, we have to start thinking about that problem so for those who didn't write uh, 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 a topic there yet try try to formulate something uh, it's your first your first uh, exercise to do that uh, and again for next week you will have to have an objective. It may not be the final objective, but you will have to have an objective and a suggestion of a possible way of solving that, right? I noticed that someone else wrote. Do you want to, uh, Indira, have you had a, a chance of reading what people have already written there and, and maybe? Yes, I'm looking at yeah. Marina's comment. And <clears throat> so first of all, um, I'm, I'm glad you're working already with the, you know, you have your advisor and you have, um, uh, a topic, Marina, on relational risk and technology use. Uh, so that's it's, it's good. Again, you have um, some umbrella, as, as Alexander is saying, some umbrella, some, and of course the support of your advisor. So that's uh, that's a great thing. And and thanks for sharing the topic. Now, of course, you want to narrow down and see which one, which part of that's going to be your baby. But uh, as you continue doing research, you continue learning. Now, I like your question. Um, but what are the implications for us as researchers of using uh, mixed methods? So, um, <clears throat> uh, well, a practical answer would be, well, you have um, uh, more opportunities to publish, <laughs> you know, because you can do, oh, I am qualitative, I'm quantitative. Uh, but also uh, the most important is because you have the uh, ability to know about the problem from multiple perspectives that that's what i was saying you know you are able to to understand your problem uh, with depth and breadth right so having a better understanding of your your problem of uh, about your research question and the data now um, now in terms of what to pay attention to um definitely the things that i mentioned you know do you have the time do you have the access to the data um, those are going to be things that you will have to consider. So, sorry, Alexander, please go ahead. No, no, I was going to, to, to say here that for historical reasons, our area, our field of information systems still tends to be more quantitative than qualitative, but it has changed a lot over recent years. And um, mm -hmm. I would dare to say that we see more interesting qualitative research these days than quantitative research. So don't be shy of using qualitative methods uh, simply because uh, many, uh, the, the, many of the more traditional journals still sort of privilege or, or still prefer uh, papers that are, that are at least that, that, that are partially quantitative. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which we can uh, use qualitative methods to, well, to show things that uh, the world of business has already realized, at least since the, the 90s. I remember when, um, what's their names, uh, Norton and Kaplan, those balance score cards guys, said that, uh, and they were criticizing the people that had a, a, a quantitative mind. They, 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 they claimed that, uh, well, the, the traditional accountants, and of course they were talking about accounting, the traditional accountants uh, accountants prefer to be precisely wrong than vaguely right right we nowadays already uh, understand the value of being vaguely right uh, and and it's it's easier to be vaguely right with qualitative uh, research than quantitative besides if you're vaguely right you give others and yourself the possibility of being more precisely right 
afterwards because maybe using mixed methods then you can say well i already understand what uh, an interesting issue is because you know i i i'm vaguely right about it now i can be more precisely right using a a, a and, and maybe you can go into the quantitative uh, methodology but don't don't be scared of being qualitative because our our field is opening its um, its heart to, mm. to qualitative uh, research more recently and uh, we see a lot of very interesting stuff coming out yeah yeah and marina is asking qualitative is can be more acceptable if we combine with quantitative uh, yeah in a way and, and again you can be also more versatile because you know you, you you're showing that uh as a researcher that you have the ability to do either qualitative or quantitative so as a doctoral student uh, uh, it's a good thing that you uh are able to do that of course it's more challenging it's like wh which one am i expert on well you kind of be have to be able to to do both things um but in terms of publishing uh, again it makes more, your research more interesting uh, but it could be uh, you know in terms of resources again a little longer and um than purely quantitative uh, uh but it's gonna be uh yeah a more um um rigorous study more uh, uh it could be more acceptable yeah, that's a good point Marina. some additional criticism uh there uh that more recent qualitative researchers have with respect to quantitative uh methodologies is that sometimes uh people try to use very sophisticated methods to solve questions research questions that do not need that level of sophistication and and when you mm -hmm. when you use a lot of sophistication you make you may even make the the problem uh, seem fuzzier than it really is uh, so you 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 can't even communicate your results so well because the method was too too complex so uh, some some people say it's almost like using a cannon to shoot a fly right mm -hmm. uh, i don't know how they say that that, that in english but uh, yeah in, in Portuguese, we have that expression yeah, yeah. You know, to, to, to use a cannon, to use very, a very sophisticated method or uh, to, to solve a problem that could be solved in a much easier way. So, yeah. I, you I, know, I, I, yeah, go on, Nigeria. Yeah, I would just say another thing could be also, um, again, if you want that um, breadth of understanding, I think that's something that could be applicable to our Latin American context, because many times we have uh, we have a great uh, quantitative tools that were created for a different context, right? Like, and you will try to just uh, uh, translate a scale to your language, but you're not looking at something else that is missing. And that's what the, the, the combination of methods will give you, you know, what is it you're missing? So maybe you, you with, with this uh, scale, you can see this, but there's something missing and the open-ended questions would allow you to see what else is happening that hasn't been explored before. Uh, so, so that perspective, uh, especially again, if, if you're using a study as a basis that was conducted in Europe or or in the US or somewhere else, uh, with the qualitative, you might, you might end up capturing uh, the uniqueness of the Latin American context. So if you don't reflect on that when you are importing a methodology that was perfectly designed for a different context, you will be, uh, it will be like having a cannon to shoot a fly, but, uh, but still aiming at a different, you know, sh shooting it in a different direction, which means that not even the fly, you, you, you won't be able to kill even the fly because you, you missed it, uh, uh, because you, again, you, you're using very sophisticated, techn sophisticated technology to solve a problem that is either not your problem it was someone else's problem and you just imported the problem and without uh reflecting on how important that problem is to your own context so there's a lot that we can do with uh qualitative research and and i i sometimes have also this feeling that um, there are many researchers that hide sorry that hide behind sophisticated methods so they learn sophisticated methods so that they can uh, deal with sometimes even poor research simply because they, the sophisticated me method uh, makes it, it feel uh, uh, that they also have a sophisticated problem or, or they have a relevant problem. And indeed, it was not relevant or the method 
uh, was not appropriate for it. So it's always important to think of what you what you plan, what you want with your research, and how that that methodology can help you achieve that. And if that is the methodology that will best suit that problem, because sometimes it isn't. Yeah, great point. Okay, uh, so let's move on to case study. I don't know how much more time do we have. I'm just worried about the time. Oh, we, we're fine. Yeah, we're fine. We, we, I think we have maybe f another half an hour or so at least for you to, to talk about uh, that. And then we can still go on a, a little further. We have at least one hour from now. Uh, for, for, okay, you know, so let's talk about case study. And again, uh, I thought about case study because I I heard about the background that you you guys have, and and I thought that that could be a way. So um, now there is uh, there are two articles about case studies that I provided. So I provided two articles about mixed methods. One, uh, the one that um, synthesized the. 52 articles and one example of uh, mixed methods. And then the other two articles are about case study. One that talks about the case study research in information systems. It's not that, uh, I mean, it's from 1987, so it's uh, pretty old, but it's from Ben Bassat and it's an MIS quarterly article that pretty much summarizes uh, what the case study research has been and provides again some recommendations for anybody who wants to do case study, which I thought that are still applicable for today. Uh, so it's a good foundation. And then the other article is an example of a case study that was published in 2022. So a recent application of, uh, of case study. So you have both um, um, want to see the advice, right? What to do, what not to do, and then example. So let's talk about case study research. Uh, so the case study, um, well, in 19, back in 1987, they said, oh, it's, there's an, a, an interest growing in the using of qualitative techniques. Again, the, the interest is low, but I can tell you for sure, based on my attendance to the MIS quarterly uh, seminar last week and Alexander confirming here, there is more interest to open to qualitative studies. So that's, that's a good thing. And that's what the researchers always say, Ben Basad et al. in that article. So the case study, the, the main characteristic of the case study is that it's looking at a uh, phenomenon and an issue in its natural setting, right? So uh, I know many of us are used to the case studies like the Harvard case studies, when we look at uh, um, uh, case studies as a um, as an article that that is already written, but not as a research methodology. So let's just uh, clarify that uh, case study is used in two different ways. One is the case study as something that it's written as a, as a study that was written. Uh, in, in all the business schools, we use like the Harvard case studies to uh, analyze a topic. But from a researcher perspective, we're looking at the case study research methodology, you know, like the method that we follow to uh, to conduct research. So so I hope that that's clear, you know, wh what we mean by uh, by the case study research. So in this... Uh, in Europe, Yes, and okay. maybe it's even clearer if we say that in Portuguese or Spanish because in English it's all it's only one expression case studies for 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 the case that is the Harvard uh, style cases uh, that uh, and and also for the case study research but I, I guess in, at least in Portuguese and I, I believe it also happens in Spanish we have uh, caso de estudo e estudo de caso yeah. mm -hmm. so. The, uh, a case study and a st study of a case, right? So what researchers do is the study of a case and not. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that's also Spanish, right? You 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 can say. Uh, uh, can you say? Uh, uh, yeah, ma makes sense. I just haven't used that like that, but it it makes perfect sense. So yeah, in Portuguese it's like that. We uh, and 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 people mix up things mm -hmm. because we usually talk simply about about a case. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah. uh, but if we think of a, the, the, a case study and the study of a case, the study of a case is research. You're studying yeah. a specific case. Uh, a case study is something that someone has already performed and it has been prepared exactly. for possibly for teaching and for 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 learning for for us mm -hmm. to expose a situation and 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 explore it with uh, students. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. good. So we are. Uh, so I just want to read Antonio's comments. Normally, is the tutor who defines what the research problem is as well as the objectives of the work, since this is closely linked to the lines of research and publications. Yeah, what is your express uh, your idea about that, Indira? Is is that what you usually do with your students? You define their, their even their problems? No, I think that um, the European school is more uh, in that. Uh, more like that, that way. Like in, in Europe most mostly you are as a doctoral student you do what your tutor tells you but in the US the uh, students choose their own topics I mean the the but in the area that the risk the the chair is knowledgeable about right like you're working with the yeah. chair they, they have to be knowledgeable about that but it's your baby it's your topic so the advisor would choose the topic uh, and then uh, the, the the researcher or the students uh, could at least uh, negotiate the well, he, well the actually problem. in the US usually the student chooses the advisor yeah 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 okay all right he, but, but he, he chooses whatever area he, you like the student uh, chooses the advisor because of the topic uh, with which the, the advisor is usually expertise involved expertise area of research yeah. yeah so yeah and i think that also happens here in latin america uh i i, I would uh, of course there, there there may be some advisors that are a little bossier in the way they they work and maybe it's the ones as indira said that had some backgrounds the in european, european school, european, yeah. uh, school uh, background but in general it's important that the, the, the advisor um, well has students that are working with a topic that the advisor is familiar with, right? And, 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 and is interested in because the research that is, is developed, most of you, you will write and your, your advisors are going to be your co-authors in many situations. Not all situations, but in many situations, it, if, it's a, if it's a study that, that is carried out as part of your uh, of your training as a researcher and uh, and together with your advisor, most probably he or she will be a co-author, even if most of the, the efforts to write the paper was carried out by you. Uh, their ideas, their reviewing, well, and, and even their writing is part of, uh, of, of the paper, so it, it should be acknowledged. Uh, but I, I would still prefer, if, if, if you find, uh, you know, advisors that are too, strict in the way they they control the research that you're doing you become almost like if you were a, a chess piece right that someone else is playing with it's it's no good in my in my idea at least it's no good because you're not going to be a, an independent researcher in the future if you cannot at least negotiate your research question uh again under the umbrella of a the, the larger uh interests uh, of your advisor so i think try and negotiate research questions that are meaningful to you uh, under the umbrella of what is meaningful to your uh, advisors. I think uh, that way everyone will be happy. Uh, you will be writing about something that is meaningful to you uh, and your advisors are going to be able to support you in, in doing that and provide you with good literature um, um, support and, and provide you with, uh, with ideas that, uh, that, that will contribute to a, a much better research work. Yeah, so, and also, uh, you know, just like everything, it depends on the um, resources, uh, right? Like, uh, I'll tell you, when I started my, doing my PhD at Syracuse University, the it's it's funny because Michelle, the the co-author that I talk about, my friend and and mentor, she was my first uh, chair, <laughs> and uh, so we definitely get along. They 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 found a good match, I would say, because she worked in industry before starting her PhD. I worked in industry. Um, she worked in insurance companies. I worked in banking, and I was interested in again, the impact of uh, technology in organizations. So uh, they they match me with her because of that. You know, you 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 write this is my area of research, interesting, and this was her expertise. So good match, perfect. But then I applied to a research grant uh, from the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. And uh, well, I, I didn't apply. I helped uh, apply with, with another professor, um, Jeff Stanton, uh, who was working with, with grants. And I volunteered to do research there. Of course, I was doing research there. You know, I, I like to be involved in multiple projects. And then we got the grant. You know, I, I, we, we wrote this, this proposal and we received the grant. 
so then immediately, of course, I had to be, a, a, I, I became the senior research associate of that grant. So then I changed chairs <laughs> because my chair was the one who was in charge of the grant. So he had the funding and, and thanks to that funding, I had students helping me in my research, you know, with, so it really depends. Uh, again, you work with the chair that is um, that can can help you do your research. But at the end of the day, that dissertation, that paper that you're going to publish, guess who's going to be the first author? You, right? Like so, the chair is going to be a second author, or um, usually the second author. But you are the first author, so it's your baby. So you definitely want to have a uh, want to make sure that you have a say on what's happening to the baby, how, and also at the end, you will be the real expert on that topic. Even if your chair is very involved in the topic, the real expert is you and you will be able to answer those questions. Uh, um, so, so think about that, you know, even if you're working with the chair, you are acquiring and becoming expert in a specific area and what you are writing is, is going to be your baby. But you touched another import, uh, important uh, point there, Indira. Uh, sometimes, I mean, I think, of course, tutors or advisors have a saying. They will probably define the topic, uh, but that, that can also be defined by, uh, yeah, for example, by funding. Uh, sometimes you, yeah. you will get funding, you, get, you will get a grant or you get money to develop research in a specific topic. Then you have to decide, is that a topic that interests me or it, it interests me as much that I, I, I uh, that I'm interested in that funding, or do I think that I'm selling myself to devil, accepting that money and having to do research on a topic that doesn't interest me at all? So, so we have to be practical sometimes. Uh, and 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 you're being, let's say again, you're being educated. Uh, uh, you know, getting a, a master's degree or getting a doctoral degree is. Uh, uh, not only the result of getting a th or having a, a thesis at the end it's a process of learning the the, the you know the, the scientific methods it's a process of learning of how to do research and in fact you can even do that with a topic that is not exactly the one you you wish to study for the rest of your lives but still it, it's much easier and, and, and much nicer if we can agree uh with uh other involved stakeholders uh, what what the you know on, on a topic we can agree on a topic that we find relevant that we find interesting that we enjoy studying uh, otherwise we will do that uh, in a much less motivated uh, fashion yeah and and i have to tell you that the the study that i ended up doing for my dissertation was um, the occupational culture of it professionals uh, and and we were looking at the uh, gender differences and um, ethnicity differences, uh, you know, why people go into the IT field. So, um, and how the occupational culture impacts that. So that was uh, back then. And, and my point here is that I was always interested on, uh, I mean, I was an IT professional myself before, you know, practitioner before getting my PhD. And I was interested in that, but uh, when the, uh, the grant was looking at how to attract more people to the IT field, I gave my little uh, ingredient to the research by, you know, the, the whole IT professional thing. But then the grant is, was more, okay, what about, uh, you know, how what attracts minority and women to the IT field. So I was able to combine. So so my my point is that you also learn what you like and how to conduct your research as you continue doing it. The more you read papers, the more you uh, uh, do different activities. You learn and you situate situate yourself where you are, where you want to be. Right. So. Oh, I like this. Oh, yeah, I could continue this area. I could continue this, and this is more feasible. And this, and also, um, um, I always tell doctoral students, you know, the best dissertation is the ones that it's done. So you can always continue doing more research in in that area. But right now, uh, you as you continue narrow down, that's your topic. This is how I'm gonna finish a dissertation. This is gonna gonna finish one recipe, one cooking recipe, and then I can go and do more. Now that I am an expert, now that I, I know how to conduct, now that I know the techniques, I can do more. 
but first narrow down to something that is interesting, doable, remember the whole time and access data, doable, get it done, and then move to something else. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for the comments. And if there are any more comments, ideas, research, uh, um, topics that you like, please continue typing them. Uh, we're gonna talk about case studies. Um, again, a case study is um, looking at uh, uh, a phenomenon uh, in its own natural setting and using multiple methods of data collection. So that's why I like case studies because it allows the multiple perspective thing. You're looking at multiple methods. And, uh, and uh, but uh, in one setting. So it's, it's in the, the unit of analysis has to be uh, also uh, determined, but usually it's just in one organization or it could be a one, one group say, you know, only the, 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 the um, professionals in, in cybersecurity in a, say, in a um, professional uh, uh, agency, professional um, association, or um, just people, people uh, in a specific, uh, that have something in common. So there, uh, there is one setting. Now, this article provides, again, great advice and examples of case studies because it analyzes how case studies have been used in information systems. And they um, summarized 11 characteristics. Uh, again, the natural setting, it's in one place where things are happening. So if you're working in an industry, maybe, uh, maybe uh, you may want to conduct a case study where you're working, where things are happening. Um, I always tell students something that um, motivates you to do the research is when you see a problem, you know, something is not working. You see that, oh, you spend too much on technology, the companies are spending too much, or again, the users are not happy, or you see that uh, um, uh, people are hating the technology, or, or there's always delays, there are always complaints, you know, sometimes that negative issue uh, makes you wonder, okay, maybe we should find, do a research here and understand why, why this is happening. So um, the, the case study is in one setting, in the natural setting where things are happening. Uh, data are collected by multiple means. So again, here now we're using multiple data collection techniques. Um, the one or few entities are examined as again you want to identify the unit of analysis you care about just this company you care about this group of people you care about this uh, person specifically it's all around that person um, the complexity of the unit is studied intensively so it's very intense you know just one uh, issue um, they are uh, suitable for exploration uh, but there's also classification and hypothesis development um, so again, it could be, especially if uh, some of you are in, in master's degrees uh, as well, uh, a case study could be uh, more doable, but also um, it could bring up the, the beauty of what exactly is happening in the specific company in, in Latin America, right? Um, uh, no experimental controls or manipulations. So, of course, you know, there's no experiment. You're just looking at what's happening. You're not changing the, uh, the setting to your uh, interest for the study. And uh, the researcher may not specify a set of independent and dependent variables in advance. That's very typical in quantitative studies, right? Where you have the variables here, you don't have you. You're starting with the problem statement, the research question. Um, uh, the results derived dependent heavily on the integrated powers of the investigator. If you don't have access to a company where to do a case study, it's better not to do that. One of the first things that I ask my doctoral students to do um, in, in a case study is obtain a letter of intent. A, a letter of intent is like a, uh, you know, like officially so showing the intention that you as a researcher will conduct the research in that place uh, being careful with the confidentiality of the organization and the data that will be collected, you know, being um, ethical, 
but also for the company saying that they would allow you to conduct research and then they should put the conditions. You know, these, these are the things that you have to do if you want to conduct research in my company. So the letter of intent is a very important official agreement to say, yes, I will conduct the research, but then the company, yes, we will give access to this student to do research. If there's no official letter of intent in writing, uh, I tell my students, forget it, don't do it, because uh, I heard many situations, I had many cases where my students said, oh, I talked to the CIO, you know, I talked to the to my manager, they told me that I can do the research here. And then it turns out, uh, no, nope, you know, because there's some regulation, um, like I have in my uh, uh, former university, I work with many military students, and of course, uh, military um, veteran affairs uh, offices in the military, they have to comply with government regulations. So it's really hard to get access to uh, those companies. So it's not enough that the, my manager wanted and told me, yes, you can do the research here. Mm -mm. You have to have that in writing with all the approvals. So uh, that's a big thing. But if you are working in a small company, and I I always told that my students, you know, it's the beauty that uh, doing applied research may actually help the small businesses. Imagine small businesses don't have money to to hire uh, consultants, you know, the big uh, traditional consultants, but then you come with your research and you might end up doing uh, your research and helping them because, you, because at the end of the research, you can provide the specific recommendations for the business to do better. So that's uh, that's like, a, that, that, that would be a wonderful, right? When you can help the small businesses do something better. Like but I guess that that would also help manage uh, large companies because uh, they they also oh of course uh, yes large companies you can, but uh, usually large one, companies have yeah. the money to hire risk uh, consultants yeah. oh sure I sure they, they can hire a consultant but they can still they, they can also benefit from oh, of from being yes. a consultant or someone who's so we should never yes, yes uh, they might take or not take your advice yeah. but they will have advice that it's specific to their context you know that's a luxury and and you would learn from real world setting you know a real uh, working setting so um uh again that's why i wanted to to bring this for you to consider doing that kind of research i had students who had uh, done their uh, case studies in very small businesses even like a church you know churches are suffering after covid of not being able to attract enough uh, enough uh, mm, people and, and then um, using technology to do that a better job. You know, you see the case study, what are the things that you see the leadership, you see the the, the type uh, talking to the, um, the people who go to the church, uh, what technologies they use and then what social media, what, you know, you, you can do a case study collecting all the data and then looking at the best options. So, and then provide a specific contribution. So the beauty of the case study is definitely it can have a lot of uh, practical uh, implications um, and, and again telling the story later when you publish your paper you're doing um, two things at the same time one uh, practical contribution and another uh, publishing your research so um, again it's something to consider but again first you have to have the uh, permissions in writing uh, we we usually start with my students with a letter of intent and then if they have, uh, uh, after the proposal is approved, uh, then the letter of intent has to be kind of permission to conduct research when you have the specific details of what kind of data will be collected uh, and so on. So it's uh, a less formal first, a letter of intent. So the intention is there. And then the other one is the permission to conduct research where you have the specifics where what exactly is going to be done for uh, to do the research for with the company and the student, you know, how many times the student will come visit or how many hours they will do or how many interviews or how many emails, you know, very detailed. Because at the beginning, you don't have those details. That's why you just need a letter of intent. Later on, you have the, uh, the details and you need the written permission to do that. So that's uh, one thing to consider. And that may sound uh, maybe bureaucratic to some uh, students, but the problem is if you don't have that kind of agreement with the organization, at the end you have your dissertation ready and they say, no, you can't publish it. 
Yeah. yeah. And you can't publish it because you didn't have uh, the permission to do it, uh, or at least in a way that you can show them, no, look, you, gi you gave me the permission that I needed, so now you have to allow me to, 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 to publish it. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. it's, it's, it's good to, it's better to play safe than sorry. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Especially with something like like this, yeah. I, I, but but again, both can benefit. You know, if you if you if you sell your your idea in a way that uh, both can benefit, it, it could be a great thing. And and I always uh, uh, one of the, was telling also my students from a um, AACSB uh, point of view, the accreditor of uh, business schools, is that uh, we want to. Um, bridge the gap between theory and practice because many times theory is there and practice is there you know very far from each other but with uh, with case studies you can uh, learn from practice learn from the reality of what's going on you know in the real world and then use the theories to solve those problems you know so bridging that gap um, is is also uh, another opportunity when you do this kind of applied case studies uh, so, um, uh, number eight again was that access. Number nine is the uh, changes in the site selection and data collection methods could take place as the investigator develops the hypothesis. So, um, this also has to do with the access because depending on how what access you have, uh, for example, one of the data collection techniques is. Um, uh, analysis of existing documentation so if if once you have access you you realize that you know they will give you access to all their uh, databases or, or the you know if 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 for example the issue is customer satisfaction and then they have all the surveys they ever collected and then now you have access to all that data juicy data then of course your hypothesis can change so again depending on that access the the, the way you see the problem can change and then the case study is useful to study why and how questions because uh, they deal with operational links. Uh, so it's really why things happening, how are happening, right? You never ask a question of um, a yes, no question uh, uh, and or how much question because it's not purely quantitative. Uh, you're asking why things happening, or how it's happening, like why people are leaving uh, the the business or why they, they are not using the technology or how can they be more efficient uh, at doing this so it's really the why and how that's very common on, as part of the how you formulate the question and then the focus is on contemporary events so I again I would encourage this kind of study for to see what's going on right now at in specifically in Latin America as, as we want in context um, this is a table that you will see in the article, that in one of the articles that I share with you. And uh, it, it goes in depth in the use of case studies. Uh, and remember that there's also an option of doing um, multiple case designs where the people conduct multiple case studies from different companies, for example, and then they combine the results to build theory. Again, that's more for a traditional PhD where you are um, making a theoretical contribution, enhancing theory. Uh, but of course, you can also just do a one case study uh, and, and, and publish those results and then keep going, right? So um, both things can be done. And then um, this is just the terminology used in, in the uh, case research programs. Uh, are you exploring? Are you describing what, what kind of things you're doing in, in your specific research? So um, again, depending on the problem, um, you, you want to take uh, this approach why you are doing your case study. Now, when we do, uh, in general, qualitative methods, case study is one of those. Action research is also very popular if you are uh, working in, um, if you are a practitioner. Uh, but um, but then you have even you have to have more permissions because in action research you are actually changing some things and then looking at how those things are changing. So case study is more observing. You're not changing anything. You're just looking and from different 
points of view and but you're not changing anything you're man, not manipulating anything you're just you, you're observing so uh, that's why sometimes it's more descriptive or exploratory but there but are other practitioners uh, in jira in jira for practitioners uh, and and some of our students here are also practitioners they are they're there in the fields uh, working with uh, with uh, computing and with information systems many times action research may be a, an interesting way to go because they are already the consultants in the process and notice mm -hmm. you don't have to be a hired external consultant you can be someone from the team that uh, from, from the organization itself who has been uh, uh, assigned to solve a specific problem and then in solving that problem you are also researching or, or, or checking in which ways you, you, your your performance the activities you, you you do in which ways they change the change reality and that can also be studied so action research is an interesting uh, possibility for at least for some students here also yeah, yeah if, if you have the permissions but also if you have the event the yeah. the action you know for example they just adopted a new crm you know a new uh, uh, customer uh, a new um enterprise uh, resource system or whatever yes <laughs> yeah my, my words are crossed, yeah. but yeah yeah um, right <laughs> Yes, a new uh, a new kind of uh, system, customer resource management system. So if you're doing something like that, if if the company is going through that kind of big change, big uh, adoption of a new system, and then of course that's a good could be a good action research because then you're looking at the the action is there, right? Um, but um, but it's rare. I mean, I'm just saying if you have the access, uh, that would be great. So now going into the data collection. Uh, methods or techniques those are the what we call the data elicitation techniques right so documentation is one of them as i mentioned when you you want to always look at the documentation of any case study so say uh, even the organizational chart the mission the vision the strategic plan if they have one you know or any documentation that they give you access to in many cases the documentation uh, would be also the whatever is online, right, that it's already easy to access. Archival records, as I mentioned, if they give you access to the customer satisfaction service that they had. Um, and then direct data collection techniques like interviews, focus group questionnaires. Um, many of my students used uh, uh, questionnaires um, first open-ended because that's kind of like an easy uh, to send online and get in first input, but then go with the in-depth interviews and then kind of like focus groups. Like for example, in my uh, program, we we would uh, to my students, we would if they use case study, we would ask them at least three different data sources. Uh, so it could be um, questionnaires or with customers, and then interviews with the IT professionals and then focus group with the leaders but then you see each each data collection will have to have a reason for example you can have a, you can have a um the 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 questionnaires for the customers to find out why they are not happy about uh, the it professionals to describe how they're using the technology to solve the problem and then the leaders at the end to really discuss what are the possible solutions to solve the problems. So different um, data collection techniques. Observations are also popular where the researcher just, you know, observes and take notes. Um, like we did that, uh, that a lot when we were looking at information security problems. And information security is, um, <clears throat> you know, is, is something, uh, is a very important topic now uh, because of all the different uh, data breaches but uh when you as a researcher go and, or even as an auditor you go and observe uh, how people are using the technology you know like the, the typical example is when you have the password under the keyboard uh that's something that people maybe won't tell but then when you're observing you see the different behaviors or when you do the you leave the door open you know without to the next person when they should identify themselves use their uh the key themselves uh, so Again, uh, observations are another great way of uh, of looking at, at a problem. And then the physical artifacts, uh, and that has to do with looking at uh, devices, outputs, tools, and so on. So those are the five um, data collection techniques. 
Uh, and I just wanted to see what is it you were uh, typing, Alexander? No, I was just ju just answering Antonio there because Antonio uh, sent us a link to his uh, thesis. Oh. Uh, as, and you know, people, what you ha you have to do now, you you get Antonio's uh, thesis and check if it follows our templates. <laughs> Considering that we have a template for our, our research, check if he, if he followed our template, even without knowing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably does because I like your template is, is general enough. So, okay. So these are the five popular uh, data collection. And it, again, it's all in one setting. Now, um, this just talking about case study again. It all depends on the access you have, uh, and then uh, the engagement that you want. You know, will will they allow you virtual uh, online? Now, the, the technology just offers so many opportunities because now you can collect data just virtually, and then you do this thing. You know, like you record, and then um, it uh, it will even transcribe for you. And you just have to review and uh, fix the, I mean, review the transcripts. But basically, technology is doing a lot of, in the past, things used to be more difficult. I always tell everyone, you know, thanks to technology, things are uh, easier. And this is one example. You can now conduct these interviews using Zoom uh, or, or any, uh, or Google Meet. And then you can uh, record that and then get all this, uh, uh, transcripts. Um, so always looking at the access is a big problem uh, and estimate an appropriate uh, um, time uh, and of course the ethical concerns. Um, you know in, in the right. US you cannot collect any data without your IRB approval. So I know that in Latin America it really depends on which university and where you are. But uh, I remember we talked about this with uh, with Guillermo, right, in, in this presentation, that uh, a good uh, um, that could be another topic just to talk about all the different kinds of permissions and that should be obtained uh, to collect data. Indira, I'm curious here. Uh, does uh, Zoom provide you with uh, the transcripts uh, straight, or or do you have to sort of get the audio and and and, and get it uh, uh, converted into into text by some other technology afterwards no it just gives you the transcript it does okay it does uh, yeah well, of course the quality cool. will depend on the accent as well yeah yeah sure sure sure, sure, sure. Yeah. in english uh mm -hmm. that's the problem with some of the software that uh, sometimes doesn't do it in other languages Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, sometimes uh, the, the challenge that we have when we are doing research and we are interviewing people, well, if we are, if we Latin Americans are interviewing people in English, we already have the problem of our own accents in English that makes yeah. uh, transcription probably a little, a little more difficult. And we also have the challenge when we are interviewing people in Portuguese or Spanish, that sometimes the algorithms that do the, trans the automatic transcription they are not as well developed for other languages than English. But yeah. still, uh, this is improving and it's improving fast. I remember that in the past, it's improving transcribing, fast. Yeah. yeah, transcribing was something that took ages from students. And it's absolutely necessary uh, if you want to do some sort of more systematized, uh, systematic uh, way of analyzing those data. For example, using uh, software like uh, and Vivo or or what's the other? There's a, there's another one. Uh, At yeah, Atlas the, TI, Atlas TI, Atlas TI. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I I mentioned here some of that, but yeah, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Like I well for transcripts also there's other AI. You know for artificial intelligence, other AI. Uh, it's O T T E R other AI that um uh, that does the transcripts just transcripts for for recording so that's uh, another way but zoom is now very uh, also uh, useful i mean when, once you receive the recording you will receive the file with just the transcript what is the uh, other software that you mentioned in your uh, could, you, could, you could you type that down uh because that that may be important for people that are not using zoom for example google meets uh to my at least to my understanding doesn't have a feature like that but it's I sometimes what I do is I I get I record and then I include it in a 
YouTube uh, link uh, uh, and, and a private link, well, not a private, uh, an unlisted link, and then Zoom, uh, and then we, uh, YouTube uh, tr uh, transcribes it, and then I, okay, author AI, uh -huh. perfect. Yeah, author yeah. AI. Yes. That may be yeah. some uh, uh, an interesting tool for you to use if you're if you're doing transcriptions. Good. Thank yeah. you. So it has the free version that it's uh, free. Um, um, but then they have, of course, um, other premium versions for a price. But I will talk also about the data analysis, which again is has evolved. Like I remember when I started doing qualitative research, I used um, Atlas TI, but it was super expensive. You know, we're talking about thousands of dollars. It was very expensive. It's still very expensive. But now the one that I encourage, uh, that I recommend the students to use, it's the DOOS. And I'll, I'll mention that the DOOS is, um, was developed by a researcher here at UCLA. And um, it, it requires, it's not free, but uh, you just pay when you use it. So uh, like say, I'm gonna use it in the month of November, so I just pay in November and it's like 20 something dollars for that time where you're using for month, right? So uh, so you just pay that month where you're using and after that you don't have to. So it is uh, it is much cheaper than many other options. Um, but also I have seen many students doing the uh, qualitative data analysis uh, by hand, you know, like in using cards like the old way or just uh, using Excel now with different colors and codings. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something you have to consider. I think it's a still a big difference compared to the software like Atlas TI or NVivo that used to be thousands of dollars. Very expensive. You know what my students have been doing with NVivo, uh, they first they watch all the videos they can on NVivo on YouTube so that they know what to expect from, from the software and they can learn and use it fast. And then they use it, uh, and Vivo allows them to use it freely for a month. And then they do the whole analysis during that there you month. Go. You can do that, yes, in a month. So it's ways of yeah. tricking the system and and and, and making uh, uh, at least uh, well cheaper use of uh, of it without yeah. spending much money. Yeah. Now the dues again is um, allows the monthly thing, uh, which is uh, which is nice. You know, you just pay when you use it. Uh, you, you see that you, you can use, we charge about $10, $11 per month. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's pretty reasonable for. Yeah, consider the game to these other uh, softwares that, uh, yeah. Um, and it's very new. Like I have been working with them since they developed. So they just have like three, four years. But they, these researchers from UCLA uh, have done a very nice job again. And, and it can be web-based as well. So. Anyway, so that's about data analysis, but going into uh, first you determine where you're going to collect data from and how. Uh, then, um, uh, well, these are, the, remember all the different developing the protocols. Uh, I always say when you're doing this qualitative research, you want to um, develop even scripts, you know, what exactly you're going to say when you conduct the interview or the focus group. Uh, and if it's going to be secondary data, like company uh, records, archives, uh, that could also be qualitative or quantitative. So whatever you can obtain for your research, always think, okay, how is this gonna help me answer my main research question? Why am I interested? Am I interested about, uh, for example, I'm interested about the, the number of complaints that, that we have in the service desk, you know? So then uh, if that is related to that, then I'll use it. Otherwise, no, I won't use it. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, and the notes and the, and the fields, they are all open-ended. Um, and you want to um, put that in the, in the different protocols. Uh, and also the, uh, thinking about the participant itself, right? Who is the participant? And if you're not sure, ask. Uh, I always think that, and that's where you need the advisor or the chair uh, of, whoever is working with you, you know, ask how much uh, is, is good enough, like where you're going. So that's where you need that kind of input from others. Um, now, in this case, you see the qualitative instruments are created by the researcher. 
So that's the the thing that uh, that's why you know the, the validity quantitative researchers say you know where it's very subjective because you're creating your questions, you are analyzing. Uh, but the only way you can uh, justify your choices is by documenting and justifying every choice you make. And when you do your when you develop your instruments. Uh, you want to think about the research questions, uh, but also uh, get some use some um, reliability method. For example, in qualitative research, you use you have an expert panel. So once you develop your questions, you can uh, use an expert panel, which will be um, people who either have the degree or work in that field. You know they they know a lot about that. Uh, usually, we we ask students to to have both. You know knowledge of the field but also a terminal degree the doctorate and then uh, they will provide feedback so they, they have to fill out another form when they actually look at the instruments and provide feedback so having the expert panel is is important because you're you are developing the instruments but you still need uh, some reliability another option is of course the 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 pilot right which again with the pilot you you, you already have to have an IRB approval, um, but that's another way for to um, to test the reliability of your instruments. Now, when we create those instruments, we call them the protocols. So the protocol is really has your introduction, like why you're doing the research, asking for the permission, and then telling exactly what's going to happen in the either interview or focus group or whatever data collection method. You have to have the a clear protocol protocol with a um, um, structure and that's why we call it it's a physical script right? like an acting script and it says uh, who as who will ask what uh, and also in some cases you may have to use some questionnaires and and instead I have seen when we created questionnaires uh, using some of the validated instruments but now that you're using it qualitative you can just simplify some things you know just again uh, combining uh, methods for data collection and then when you use archival data of course uh, you have to look at the what kind of if it's public viewing or if it's uh, private um, so it should be confidential data now in many cases the companies will tell you yes you can use my company but when you publish use a pseudonym not the real name of the company so you just say company abc so you don't tell us which company it is. And, and, and that's something you need to agree with the company. Would they allow you to use their name or not? Uh, so let's go to, uh, yes, yeah, this is what I was mentioning when two prominent approaches to check reliability is the expert review, the expert panel, that they have to have the expertise or the pilot study. So those are the two ways. And uh, remember that there's gonna be some modifications as you go. Uh, so just be ready for that as well, but you want to document everything. Again, remember, it's just like writing a recipe. You have to write everything you want. To. And here I provided examples, like this was an interview protocol. Of course, you cannot read the questions and that's not the purpose here, but I just want to show you how uh, I tried to post the questions. This was for an interview, for a face-to-face -face interview. So you want to have sometimes the questions in, in, in one page that it's and showing the flow in a clear structure you see this is about one topic this one, because in in a in a conversation with the participant sometimes you deviate right because the the respondent is talking about something else but you have clear the boxes here show the the five topics that i have to talk about so maybe i, I have deviation but i still am covering the five topics so that's why i provided here some examples this is another interview protocol but you see um uh, you have the uh, the interviewer and the researcher, the participant, you see who is going to say, uh, this is actually a transcript already, but all of them are um, categorized, uh, catalog with the, with the number coded and, and, and um, organized for a database. At the end, you still need to put everything in the database. So you have which participant was what, as well as the uh, the, this is a moderator group um, this is a guide for the moderator in the focus group in the focus group we have all the 
details exactly how you're going to open the focus group, what you're going to say at the beginning, and then how you're going to close the focus group. So it's it's really uh, time consuming, but the more you prepare, the better the data collection is going to go. It's going to be more smooth and you end up with uh, And this is uh, uh, same thing with the, with the focus group uh, where uh, I'm showing the different um, um, starting uh, types of questions, how you start with the question. So this is the protocol, how, what you tell them before you start, and then what you, uh, um, what kind of questions you you will ask, again, all organized. So a lot of pre-work, and this is from one of my colleagues, uh, the same thing. So again, I just wanted to show you examples of how everything needs to be prepared in advance. Um, uh, so I have more examples here in case you want to see them and then goes with the data analysis. So you get all this raw data, all these texts, and then how do we analyze it? So we pretty much uh, talk about this already when we said that um, you want to reduce data and display, display the data in, you know, you find codes first, then themes. Um, and that's like a different topic that we could, you know, discuss in more detail, but, um, but even with the qualitative data, you can go, you can take a quantitative analysis and a qualitative analysis because you can also describe, uh, so you have to describe how many minutes your interviews took, uh, how many people you participated, how many words you obtained, how many pages, you know, you, the more detail you provide, uh, the more rigorous is your research. So describe everything, you know, I collected these. Besides, took these. Yes, besides okay. Indira, I think the more detail you provide on the method, the more confidence you make your reader about the seriousness of uh, the, the reader. Exactly. That you took. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's part of convincing your audience that you were uh, uh, serious uh, in the research you, 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 you carried yeah. out. Exactly. That you were thorough, that you were like doing, following everything. But also thinking again, going back to what I said before, replicability. You know, if you describe exactly how you did it. If somebody else goes and replicates your study, your recipe, they should be able to obtain the same result. And that's why, and, and that's also why we call research scientific, right? Scientific means that you are being very uh, structured. And, and that's part of that, you know, you follow the method and you describe in details how you uh, did the, the data, what you obtained and you, you provide all these details. So um, even once you obtain the data, you have this analysis that it's qualitative and quantitative. And then we start with the, you know, trying to find the themes and the themes, um, the thematic analysis, it's descriptive, the content, the narrative, you know, all that you're looking at the, at the data. And for that, there are also different techniques. Um, remember, you don't want to discover everything. You, you're not like, Oh, let's do this way because I like it. No, there are already uh, techniques like the uh, many, many of my students use the Brown or Clerk uh, or Saldana, that it's a Spanish actually, it's Saldana with an N, <laughs> uh, but it's a famous. And, and there are, uh, well, of course, Yen in, in cases that they have steps that you should follow. Uh, so being rigorous means, oh, yeah, I'm using these steps according to Yin, according to Brown and Clerk. You know, you're saying which steps you're following in your um, thematic analysis, how you find in the codes and what's the process you're following. And this is the software, again, the do's, the one I mentioned, or Max QDA, NV, Atlas TI. Now, something important to remember is that the software doesn't determine the results of your study. The software is just helping you organize the data in codes and themes and obtain the different colors and visualize your data but it does not determine the results of your study. It's the researcher who will, uh, you know, the, the overall thing, how you end up um, taking your results that you will obtain the, the final findings. And usually in a chapter four of your dissertation or, or, or paper, that's where you show all the, result, the results obtained and that you start answering your research questions, you know, and they clarify the, the construct. Now, in many cases, the the questionnaires are built, um, and I didn't mention this, but very important to build all the instruments um, based on theory. You know, and, and you can be deductive or the inductive. 
that's a, a different uh, question. But uh, in any case, a theory is always important for any research. And in applied research, you are applying theory, you're using theory. So you have to be familiar with theories and say, how am I am using these theories to see a problem? So based on those theories, my questions are going to be aligned with them. Or my findings and analysis have to be aligned with the theory. So either way, the lenses, the theoretical lenses, would should help you uh, see the, the data and the results. So, um, so yes, that's pretty much all I had. And at the end, I included examples of um, two of my doctoral students. Uh, uh, this student uh, looked at um, uh, processes, uh, um, examining an information system uh, used to process employee awards, a qualitative study. And this is another student of mine, the influence of a business IT alignment, maturity and agile methodology in IT projects. So I just wanted to give you some examples of students who would use that. And uh, this is the Brown and Claire, you know, see the process of how uh, they analyze the data, right? Uh, because that was the, the emphasis. And this is a screenshot from the DOS, uh, where you see the data coded in different colors and the themes. Uh, that's what, uh, what you do with which that by itself could be an entire class. You know, that's a very um, long topic. Uh, but I wanted to just give you examples on, on that. Um, and that's pretty much all I had, the, the, the examples of other students that have used the topics. And then, um, yeah, my last slide, if you have any questions or comments, but that's pretty much it. Uh, use case studies, it could be very beneficial and I'll be happy to you know, if you have uh, questions, you know, is this topic good one for a case study or not? I'll, I'll be happy to help. Please feel free to reach out. A uh, mixed methodology is uh, more complex, more time. Both require uh, thorough work, detailed work, uh, but that's the beauty of research. And, uh, and good luck to everyone. And again, open for any questions or comments. Uh, whenever I think of... Uh... Well, mixed methods and 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 I I usually think of mi mixed methods already thinking more to the qualitative side because it's usually an attempt uh, that we make when we want to do qualitative research but we still want to introduce uh, quantitative uh, data uh, so maybe to, so so that we 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 get published in in those more traditional journals uh, but um, but I I do think that uh, qualitative needs uh, uh, a lot of preparation also people sometimes mm -hmm. think, oh it's just going to an interview and I, I i can get whatever people tell me and then after why awards i organize it it's impossible because of course you're interviewing several people you want to make sense of what they say comparing and contrasting what they say against right. what other people said and against the literature against uh, you know your theoretical lenses uh, and and whatever has happened in the past so if you don't plan beforehand, it turns into nightmare. So uh, yes. it's, it's, yeah. And we even used to, uh, you know what, when we started um, developing the interviews, we would record ourselves doing the interview just mm -hmm. to see how you, kind of like what you do for presentations, you record yourself and then you see the errors, the mistakes you make and how you could better improve your, your interviews. And that's a good technique, you know, just record yourself uh, and see how you are asking or uh, interacting, and then uh, you learn from that. And then when to you improve your own performance, right? Better. Yeah. Yes. To improve your own performance, but exactly. uh, also one thing that I noticed before the pandemic, uh, of course, we many times we wanted to go and interview someone, and we, we asked them, "Can I record that? Uh, is that okay if I record?" And people would feel that that would break the, you know, sometimes they would say no, or you would feel that they are they were not comfortable with that. This is an, an advantage of doing it online because nowadays people are more, much more comfortable with that. Yes, uh, of course, you still want to, want and need to ask them uh, if they allow for you to record it. Uh, even if, and, and maybe one thing that you can say is, look, I'm recording this so that it makes uh, it possible for me to, to transcribe it later and, and have a more structural an analysis. It's not, it is not that I will, this is not going to be used for any other purpose and feel you yeah. safe that uh, I'm going to delete it after I transcribe it or whatever. Oh, yeah, you delete have to try that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, somebody uh, had I a question. 
Yeah, we do have a question from Flavio, I guess. Yeah, go on, Flavio. Opa, falar em português, professor, devagar mesmo. Primeiro, parabenizar a Indira pela apresentação, gostei bastante. Tá? E é uma pergunta simples, né? mas às vezes causa um pouco de confusão. É, a diferença, embora seja, já seja bem claro, a diferença do que você vai colocar na discussão e na conclusão, às vezes eu me perco um pouco. Né? O que, que eu foco na discussão e o que, que eu foco na conclusão? Uh, well, for, for others who are not so familiar with uh, Portuguese, what Flavio is saying is that there is uh, a lot that has to appear in the discussion part of the paper. And then yeah. what is the difference between what appears yeah. in the discussion and what appears in the, appears in the conclusion part of the, the, the paper or, or, or the thesis or whatever? What is the difference between? Okay, so the conclusion uh, tells uh, pretty much what you um, uh, obtained as a, like, this is the final thing i did so at the end this is my recipe and this is how i i made it. like you kind of summarize the whole thing and this is I, concluding this is what i obtained but the discussion is more like what if you know ah uh, i uh in the discussion you say uh what if i had done this other way i should have done it that way i should have um uh, maybe I should have uh, compared these. Future research can do that. So the discussion is discussing uh, all the different possibilities, the things that you didn't do that you could have done, the things that uh, how um, your research uh, fits with others. Oh, by the way, you know all this research is exactly the same as what Alexander did. Uh, so it's you're discussing what you did. You're, like you're discussing, uh, looking at different. Um, issues there about what you just finished your research and now you're coming up with oh by the way all this work is exactly like alexander's uh, work uh, so you're comparing with uh, in many times in the discussion you also need literature because you can say my study was different than xy or mm -hmm. similar than xy so that's why you still need literature because you're discussing uh what could have happened what uh what you didn't do that you wish you could have done so then you tell us oh you know my study now i did this way but i could have done that i wish i had done that so it's all the what ifs so the discussion is you really discussing mm -hmm. discussing the discussion you get to all the details right and then in this the, in the conclusion it's going to be a summary of uh, the most thing. important details of your discussion the the, yeah. the, the most the, the entire study the conclusion is like yeah. the conclusion i'm ending and this is so it's more concrete versus the discussion is like all over, but you, you're highlighting what is important, right? The things that you wish you had said, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. So you're discussing, yeah. Yeah, I, I hope it makes sense, but great question, you know, it's like, oh, uh, what is I that? question because I sometimes put discussion in the conclusion and I, I don't know um, separate understand yeah. yes 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 like you don't separate them yeah i i agree and many authors still do that you know it's like oh for this me, should have been concluded he's confused you know yes. flavio maybe it would be clear for you and of course again i i keep telling you uh, follow the template uh, uh but the template is just a a one one possible way but in general i would say never conclude about something that you have not discussed so there is the discussion session in which you're going to explore all the possibilities of the findings that you have. And then mm -hmm. you, when you get to the conclusion, it, that's where you're going to summarize what is uh, the most, uh, I mean, what is most important about, uh, you know, the results that you got. So, but everything that, that, that should, the conclusion should not, should not bring any surprise, right? Uh, oh, yeah. When I'm reading, right. when I'm reviewing uh, papers, for example, for a, for a journal, and uh, there are things that appear only at the, the conclusion. I usually, well, I, I, when, when I'm reading, I'm writing, right? I always write, surprise, right? Surprise means this guy didn't talk about this during the whole, the whole paper, and now it appears here in the conclusion as uh, if it was uh, a conclusion. You can only conclude about the results you got in your, in your work. Uh, many, that, that's something that we, we sometimes, and I commit that mistake also, when we get to the conclusion, we want to conclude about our study 
and we want to conclude about other things as well. So many times we conclude about things that we did not study. Those are not the conclusions of your work, right? The conclusion of your work. Yeah, the conclusion needs to be grounded on your data and on contrasting the data you got from your field research with uh, with uh, with the literature. Uh, you you can't go any further, any beyond that, because then it becomes like speculation. It becomes what you guess. It becomes uh, something else that is not uh, that does not relate to it. Uh, yeah, like who's going to use that? Many times when you do your literature review, you read the abstract, right? But then sometimes you just go to the conclusion. What is it they found at the end? But then the, if you want to know um, uh, what the researchers didn't do and how to continue with that area, maybe you go to the discussion. But the conclusion really has to, you know, uh, summarize what the study, what the paper has done. I know. That's a specific points of your research in the conclusions. Mm -hmm. It's important to remark to in the conclusions uh, to accomplishment which uh, future works. Yeah, and it's only, it's yeah. only no, it's only conclusions, conclusions and future works. Yeah, okay. I Microphone have doesn't work. <laughs> no, I was just uh, saying that if we don't have any further questions, I'd like to thank uh, Indira for for being uh, here. Well, not only today; she's been with us uh, many times, and and it's always great to have her support in this uh, venture here. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Next week, next week, as I told you, uh, we will be three hours later, right? So take whatever time we we start in your country. Three hours later, that's the time that I will log in because it's the time that I'll have finished with my French students, uh, and uh, it's only going to be to discuss your objectives. So the, the homework from today until next week is to think of a an objective and a possible methodology for that. Uh, it's going to be a shorter uh, uh, meeting, probably an hour. So it, it, it depends on how many of you are able to do it. I understand that some of you will not be able to be with us. We will record. It will be available on Moodle afterwards. But my idea is simply to go there and check the, the objectives that you're suggesting and the methodology that you're thinking and telling you about the at least my perceptions of the advantages and, dis and disadvantages of using whatever methodology you're proposing to solve that specific problem, right? So that's what we'll be doing uh, next week at, at a later time, uh, still on Monday, but, but later in the day, three hours later. And then the, the week after, we will have uh, Miguel Aguirre here with us. Uh, he's a professor at uh, the Florida, Interna Florida International, I think, uh, as well. I'm not sure now. I think it's Florida International. We'll have to check. I, I think it's the same same school where where uh, George Maracas uh, is, uh, and uh, he will be talking about quantitative methods. But that's twenty five uh, two weeks from now. Okay, so see you guys. Bye. And uh, I'll, I'll send you, you. I'll send you a link through WhatsApp. All right, for for you to to send me your objective and the methodology that you plan. And of course, for now, it's just a plan. We will change from uh, many times still. We'll polish it up, but it's we have to start somewhere. Thank you, Jira. Thank you, guys.